Hello and welcome to The Painting Podcast. I'm your host, Jeremiah Polachek, your co-pilot on the pathway to becoming a better painter, or maybe just a better art lover in general. Today we're going to be talking about the work of English surrealist Leonora Carrington, her life, her legacy, what she made while living, and what she left behind. Let's get into it. The story of Leonora begins in a small Westwood house in Clayton Green, England, where she was born into a Roman Catholic family. Her father was a wealthy textile manufacturer, and her mother was from Ireland. She had three brothers, Patrick, Gerald, and Arthur. From 1910 to 1917, she lived in a Gothic revival mansion called Crookey Hall, and I looked up some different pictures of it. There aren't too many of the interiors available, but it's on a huge estate with a lot of woodlands surrounding it, and currently it's a school for children with educational problems and uh, autism. On the inside, you can see a lot of uh, deep, rich oak wooden inlays in the wall and a lot of archways, and the exterior looks a lot like what you'd imagine something out of Harry Potter would look like. This is a very extravagant and beautiful building in the neo-Gothic style. Now, spending a lot of her time here at this time in her life obviously had a great impact on her imagination and how she saw the world and how she crafted the world around her. We'll see a lot of Crookie Hall bubbling into her paintings in the years to come. One may focus solely on the architectural elements present in this building and how they shaped her imagination and her view, but the estate itself was also home to a lot of different animals. So having this giant woodlands to be able to roam around on during this time in your life would also surely have an impact on how you see the natural world and all the different animals present within it. Even though Leonora grew up in a very privileged family on a beautiful house with a beautiful estate, she actually still had a lot of behavioral problems. And I'm trying to look into, I couldn't find out exactly what this meant, and the fact that she's a woman um, probably makes it harder to judge as well, because at the time, certain behavioral ca characteristics probably um, were looked down upon in women, and throughout the rest of her life, Leonora would also be an advocate for women's rights. Nonetheless, she got kicked out, um, expelled from two different private schools. So... What do her parents do? They decide to send her to this school called the Miss Penrose Academy of Art in Florence, Italy. And you can look a little bit more into who Emily Penrose was, but essentially she's one of the first uh, publicly acclaimed academics at Oxford University and somebody who established uh, very various universities for women all throughout Europe. So she's an extremely influential figure who has all these different universities and all these different schools in these different locations, one of which is the Miss Penrose Academy of Art, where Leonora ends up. And we have to remember that uh, Miss Penrose would be somebody who would really, really want women to succeed because she's had to battle for her own recognition and her own place in Oxford herself as well. So I imagine that many of the young female students coming into her school, she's also giving them uh, this sort of energy and this sort of drive to make a place in the world, even though that they're women and even though they have to fight harder to make it, uh, it's probably the perfect place for somebody like Leonora to go and the perfect person to have as like a headmistress of a school. She wasn't teaching painting or anything of that sort, uh, but she was creating these institutions. Another important thing to consider in all of this is that the other schools that Leonora got kicked out of were these very strict Catholic schools. So previously she's being educated by nuns, and there's this sort of hierarchy, you know, a very, very strict hierarchy, and her parents themselves are also very traditional Catholics too. So her nonconformity at these schools could also be indicative of uh, a desire not to go along with this very, very strict Catholic view of the world. Well, all of that changes when she goes to Miss Penrose's Academy. And it was here 
that she would be really exposed to a lot of different types of mythology, a lot of different types of literature, and she could really dig into these ideas that were very, very uh, relevant at the time. So she would continue on. She would continue going to this, uh, this school for a few years, and upon completing her studies, she would go back to England where there's this sort of strange upper-class aristocratic ritual that would take place, which is called being presented at court. And uh, what this basically means is that a woman is mature, she's educated, and all this sort of thing, and it's like a debutante ball, basically. It's all focused on Leonora. And um, essentially, you know, in, in previous times, uh, probably uh, during those times as well still, you would find, a, you know, a, another wealthy young textile, son of a textile merchant who would also take your interest. And then you'd get married and both of, your, both of their families would be happy in the sea of money that they had created together. Uh, however, Leonora wanted no part in that. But she did show up. She did show up to the event and she shows up to it with a copy of this book by Eldis Huxley called Eyeless in Gaza. And the choice of this book is obviously very prescient because this novel focuses on four periods in the life of a young socialite named Anthony Beavis. And it's not in chronological order, but basically it describes his experiences as he goes through school, college, uh, different romantic affairs, and it expounds upon the meaninglessness of upper-class life during these times. And in this book, uh, there's a gradual disillusionment with high society that comes to a head when one of his friends commits suicide. So after this suicide in the book, he then begins to seek a source of meaning, and he uh, begins to find it in mysticism as well as pacifism. So this book and the choice to bring this book to this event is kind of a giant uh, screw you, for lack of a better term, to the high class society which she was a part of. Leonora felt a part of it, uh, but she knew she wasn't, she wasn't those people. She didn't want to be those people. And, you know, somebody to have their life given out before them uh, she she would never have to work a day in her life if she didn't want to, regardless. She could just marry somebody and live off of her father's money. But that was completely uninteresting to her. And as she said, she did not want to, quote, uh, be sold off to the highest bidder at, at this debutante ball, so to speak. So instead, she brings this book to read. And all these other people are probably looking at her like, oh, you're reading Huxley? You're reading that Huxley book? But books would also be something... Uh, very important to her as well, of course, as she was a voracious reader, as well as a writer and novelist as well. But we'll get into that later. So she survives being presented at court. She doesn't have to be married off to the son of a rich uh, textile merchant. And she goes to school in London. She goes to the Chelsea School of Art. And later on, she'll transfer to another school in London, which is called the Aux Enfants Academy of Fine Arts, and this was a school that was established by the French modernist Amade aux Enfants. And if you look up this guy's uh, this guy's paintings, he's part of what's called the Purist movement, and uh, he created his own Academy of Fine Arts in London. And his paintings are very, very um, distilled. We could say they use very, very vibrant colors, but the images in them are often still lifes and these sorts of representations there's a lot of nods to cubism but there's a more structural approach and refined approach there's not a lot of loose brushwork instead there's a lot of more highly modeled brushwork and bright pastel -y colors so he's a great painter that i just discovered as well through my research on uh, leonora but so she attends his school and here is she's going to be taught all the basics of painting, most likely, you know, just how to apply paint on a canvas, how to mix colors, all these sorts of things. And of course, Amade would also have uh, his own views about art and the use of color and all these sorts of things. And he wrote 
various manifestos uh, about how to use color properly. So if you look at these paintings, uh, I kid you not, if you look at this Amade Ozanfant painting next to a Leonora Carrington, you're going to see a lot of similarities in color. There's this kind of mute, I don't know what to call it exactly, but there's like a muted brightness and vibrance in all of these colors and this kind of gray neutral tone, but yet there, there's such a purity in the color that is presented. So above all else, she, she was given a great foundation upon which to build at a very, very young age. And she took advantage of this to the greatest extent that she could. When she was about 19 years old, she would be given uh, the book Surrealism. It was Herbert Reed's book by her mother. And um, Herbert Reed was a, a, a prominent art historian who wrote a lot about art, and he wrote a lot about art education as well, as well as being a, a prominent anarchist. So you can imagine his, his angle on uh, teaching and the academy that came before and all these sorts of things. And so she's given this book, Surrealism, and this really opens up a whole new world for Leonora that she can explore and resonate with, essentially. And, but this is 1936. So Surrealism starts in the late 1910s, early 1920s, and a lot of people aren't aware that Surrealism actually began as a literary movement. So there was a lot of automatic writing, and automatic writing was very important. Uh, essentially, what automatic writing is, is just allowing for a stream of consciousness to come out and not care too much about what you're writing, and then looking back upon it, perhaps there are some clues or some deeper meaning that you didn't even know existed in the first place that bubbled out of your subconscious. Now, this is an idea that's going to really, really resonate a lot with Leonora, because her paintings would also have this kind of dreamlike automatic writing, automatic painting, which would also come out of automatic writing, approach to them, where she's creating these characters. You don't necessarily have to know the exact meaning of who they are or what they are. It can be discovered later. And a lot of this is also present in this book that she was given by her mother when she was 19 years old. Around the same time, there was this international surrealist exhibition which happened in London, and amongst all the artists showing there was the German surrealist Max Ernst, and she loved his work immediately, and remembered it, all this sort of thing. It, it made a great impact on her when she initially saw the paintings themselves. Uh, then a year later, they'd be at a party together, and remember, both of these people are kind of, you know, they're doing well. These are the socialites in London at the time, and they would just meet at a party held together in London, uh, they'd hit it off, and then they'd move to Paris, where Ernst would uh, divorce his wife. So in 1938, they leave Paris together. They're, they're together now. Max Ernst and uh, Carrington are together now. Uh, the two artists uh, move out to this place in southern France where they would, you know, collaborate and kind of help each other's artistic development. And... They'd have this, you know, this beautiful house with all these sculptures outside of animals and all these sorts of things. And um, their whole house would become full of all of their artworks. Their house itself and the surrounding garden would become like an architectural and artistic installation in and of itself. And they would even make paintings of each other while they were there as well. And Max Ernst would make this painting called. The Triumph of Love, where we see uh, the indications of both people within the relationship, uh, Carrington and Ernst both, and there's kind of this long reptilian bird-like creature and a sculptural element in the center of the canvas in this strange and surrealist landscape. But at least there would be two people in, in that painting of them together, whereas Leonora's painting of Ernst would be a lot more icy, I guess we could say. That would be one way to say it. Um, it takes place in this, you can look up Portrait of Max Ernst uh, if you want to take a look at it on your phone or whatever. But in, in this painting, we see a, a frozen landscape and there's this frosty frozen horse in the background and Ernst is kind of this half fish 
fluffy fish man creature that's walking through this landscape. So if we're looking at how did she portray Ernst, this painting gives us a really good look. And the icy nature of it is something that's it's really hard to get beyond. Nonetheless, they, they live together at this beautiful estate in southern France. And what happens? Well, World War II happens, of course. And Ernst kind of gets hit from all sides, as, as many artists do during this time. So first he's arrested by the French authorities for being, quote, a, a quote, hostile alien. So during this time, there's this rise in nationalism. And a German, you know, he's a German painter, Ernst. Uh, so he was considered a hostile alien. And uh, they, thankfully, they, they released him after a few weeks. But then, just a few months later, Ernst would be arrested by the Gestapo for being a degenerate artist. So he, he really can't win, no matter uh, what side he's on here. And this greatly affected Leonora, of course, as well, to, to have this insane bureaucracy during the start of a war uh, single out somebody in the middle of nowhere making sculptures and paintings and, and putting them in prison not once but twice because of it, uh, that would be enough to make anybody probably lose faith in humanity altogether. So this was a, a huge blow to Leonora. However, uh, Ernst, thankfully, was lucky enough to flee, and uh, he, like many other artists, went to the United States. But for Leonore, the, the damage had really be, been done. From that arrest, it absolutely broke her. And she, she goes, her friend Catherine Yarrow steps up and basically says, come to Spain and, and live with me. And that's where she went uh, after Ernst was gone. So she stayed with family and friends in Madrid, but she was experiencing really terrible anxiety as well as delusions that eventually led to a psychotic break. And um, at this point, she was admitted into a mental asylum and was given electroconvulsive therapy and also given drugs, uh, very, very par powerful barbiturates and these sorts of things, anticonvulsants, and, um, you know, just <laughs> give, give her a break. <laughs> I mean, come on. But uh, anyway... Her parents, I, Lord knows what they think now that she's in the insane asylum. So they're like, we're going to send you to this sanatorium in South Africa, right? So she's, she's en route to South Africa, and she stops in Portugal. And this is where she, she makes her escape. Um, she goes to the Mexican embassy, and she finds this guy, Renato Leduz. And uh, he's a poet and Mexican ambassador. And this guy was actually a friend of Pablo Picasso, and they, they went to bullfights together. So the two of them agree to this marriage of convenience uh, so Carrington can be given immunity and, you know, become a diplomat's wife, so to speak. Regardless, Ernst is gone. Their, their relationship ends with that arrest and with Ernst fleeing Europe for New York City. And who helped him get to New York City, none other than Peggy Guggenheim, and Ernst would go on to marry Peggy Guggenheim in 1941, and so Ernst and Carrington never got back together again. They weren't married, uh, but their relationship is now done, and uh, she's got a marriage of convenience to this Mexican poet. So what does she do? She does the same thing everybody else does. She moves to New York with Ledutz. I have no idea if she crosses paths with Ernst during this time, or if he's off hanging with the Guggenheims. But she stays in New York for a couple of years, and she's making works, and she's married to, you know, this Mexican diplomat, so they're sending some works down to Mexico for group shows and these sorts of things as well. So she's actually having shows in Mexico uh, and in Mexico City before she ever moves there. Well, yeah, that's what happens. She moves there. Um, so after about two years in New York, Leonor heads down to Mexico with her husband, as many other artists did. And uh, the interesting thing, as I said before, was that since she already had shows down there, she already had some recognition. So she, she lands in Mexico City, 
And it's a place she begins to really, really love, and she stays there for the rest of her life. But she kind of hits the ground running, so to speak, because she already has some established success. And of course, being married to a, a Mexican poet and diplomat with all these sorts of connections doesn't hurt either. So it's really in Mexico where Carrington begins to make this a really huge body of work that would uh, encompass the rest of her life. And during this time, she would write, uh, I painted for myself. I never believed anyone would ever exhibit or buy my work. And unlike many of her contemporaries, Carrington wasn't necessarily drawn to these uh, popular psychoanalytic theories of Freud that many of the other surrealists would be into and embracing. Uh, instead, her art explores these realms of magical realism and alchemy, and there's a strong focus on these autobiographical details and symbolism all taken from her own life. And it's hard to ignore the fact that she is a she, and she really sees the world through this female uh, eye, whatever you would call it, the female gaze or whatever. Um, but she's, she is looking at women in a very, very different way than the male surrealists are looking at women. And she really aims to present female sexuality from her perspective. And this, this challenges this traditional male-dominated view of surrealism, uh, which, you know, was common at the time. So Carrington's work begins to really deeply explore this theme of women's role in the creative process. And she often portrays the female body intertwined with some sort of naturalistic, mysterious force. And in 1938, she'd paint this painting, she'd make a self-portrait that would really give us a, a good insight into Carrington's personal take on female sexuality uh, while she's stepping away from the surrealist movement's conventional portrayal of women. Uh, in this painting, along with others, it would showcase this interest in alchemy and the transformation of matter. And this reflected her belief that there was a creative and destructive power of desire. And in this self-portrait, Carrington uses a mirror to explore this duality, being both the observer and the observed. A hyena, which appears in this and later works, symbolizes the merging of male and female, of night and dream, and it's in the background of this painting as well. And the use of animals is something that Carrington would do often in a lot of her paintings, where she would use symbolism to allude to a broader narrative or idea. And her alter ego itself would be a white horse that you're going to see in a lot of her paintings as well. So Leonora is really situated in this interesting space that walks the line between alchemy, the occult, and fantasy, and the natural world, and religion, and all these sorts of things. And of course, this relates directly to painting for, for centuries. There's a connection between alchemy and painting as well, the idea of taking lead and turning it into gold and using pigments to create these beautiful paintings, uh, the transform transformative process of painting of course, is in there as well. If you're interested in a book, I recommend What Painting Is by James Elkins, which goes into this idea a lot further. But uh, Carrington is really interested in all these intersecting ideas. And she's creating these animals and these hybrid creatures that really play a significant role in, in her art as serving, um, you know, as symbols for primal instincts, transformation, and the unconscious. Hybrids and fantastical creatures, such as half-woman, half-horses, um, are, are not something that are uncommon in her work, and they suggest the merging of the human and animal, as well as the conscious and the subconscious that exist in both physical and spiritual worlds. And this is really what's at the heart of a lot of her paintings. In addition to this, Carrington is constantly challenging these traditional representations of women in art. And she's offering, uh, I think, offering a lot more complex portrayal of female identity, power, 
and sexuality than a lot of her peers were doing, who were kind of still looking at the female body as this, you know, sexual being. Uh, and, and Carrington is, is looking more at this mystical, fantastical, magical body that can create life and meld with nature. And, and she's giving a much more interesting viewpoint of women in her paintings than somebody like Dali was making at the same time. But when we really look at her work, oftentimes, if we really distill it down to what is this thing, we make the most simplest explanation of a Carrington painting. And generally, we're presented with figures in landscapes. And this is also something common throughout art history for all of time. Of course, you could look at a, a Bruegel, maybe even see some comparisons to how figures are treated within landscapes. And all these different figures doing all these different things or a, a Bosch painting where all these fantastical figures inhabit this fantastical landscape. That is kind of the tradition that Carrington is working in, is figures in landscapes. And she's populating these landscapes with her own world building, so to speak. It's the creation of her own mythology, her own folklore. And she's drawing on her own Celtic herit heritage as well, and interest in other world mythologies. So her, her paintings become populated with these characters and narratives that are from folklore, they're from fairy tales and myths, but they're also from her own dreams. They're also from her own experiences as a person that got, you know, electroshock therapy in an asylum and had to deal with that for the rest of her life. So she's, she's examining this from an autobiographical lens as well as one a broader lens of folklore, mythology, and these kind of timeless elements that we see in paintings throughout all of history. In terms of how she's painting them, her approach to painting is very methodical, like we talked about before. There's a very certain type of palette, which is muted, yet very, very vibrant in its colors. Uh, there's, you know, a building up of form that takes time, most likely working from a sketch to a finalized version with, you know, layering and glazing and these sorts of things. So she's, she's not a painter that's just throwing down the paint and kind of seeing what happens. There's, it's not a situation that revolves around automatic painting, you know, which would be kind of like making a scribble and then finding out what's in the scribble, right? She, she's crafting this world before she paints it and uncovering these subconscious elements, uh, likely in her writing as well, which overlaps with a lot of her artistic production too. And this is one reason why I personally absolutely love Leonora's work, is this grounding in folklore, in mythology, but also an ability to place yourself in it. By doing so, you, you kind of become a character within the painting but you're also giving something to the world which everybody can resonate with and everybody can kind of pull from and everybody can understand at the same time. So it's a really generous form of art making. It's not just egotistical, autobiographical work. She's fitting it into a broader narrative and a broader, broader history as well. So while she may have said that she had no desire to sell or never thought anybody would care about her work in her life, the choice of using these types of subjects and these types of characters and these types of heroes, uh, these types of symbols and dreamlike states mixed with fantastical creatures and mythology, it's something that all of humanity is interested in because it tells all of our story in a way. You know, when we see a movie about somebody trying to kill a dragon, it's not necessarily always about killing a dragon. In the same way, Leonora is making these paintings with all these symbols present within them that a lot of people can still look into and still resonate with. And it's more than just looking at something, you know, a hybrid creature and thinking, wow, that's cool. It feels more religious. It feels more sacred than that. And we have to remember that Carrington is coming from this very strict Catholic upbringing, and she's in Mexico. She's in the land of the Mayans as well. And she actually makes a painting called The Magical World of the Mayans. So she, she's somebody that you know, comes from Christianity, but is open to all these different mythologies in the world. And those things are, are very exciting for her. It's really hard to disconnect 
Leonora from Mexico in a lot of respects. So while she would be considered uh, an expat or an immigrant or whatever you want to call it, Mexico obviously did influence her work and she would remain there for the rest of her life, continuing to publish various books as well as make tons and tons of paintings. She has a really extensive, beautiful collection and she would live there until she died in 2011. Uh, she had two sons and they became uh, intellectuals and artists as well. There's a really great picture you can see of some costumes that she made for Halloween for her sons if you want to hunt those down on the internet. But her legacy would really be with her paintings which continue to be admired and I think they, they seem more and more relevant as the years go by. So as you drift off to sleep tonight, think of Leonora, think of all the beautiful creatures that she created, and think about the symbolism present in your dreams. How does it relate to folklore? How does it relate to mythology? How does it re relate to your own autobiographical experiences? That's what a dream is, right? Thanks a lot for listening. If you're into this sort of thing, head on over to oko.academy, where you can learn about my little private art school that I have in Prague, Czech Republic, where I offer a variety of drawing and painting classes, all grounded in a historical background, but also allowing for experimentation. And if you're interested in taking some classes or coming to Prague, head on over to the website and send me a message. And uh, yeah, we can start learning together. If nothing else, just make sure to hit that follow button on Spotify or wherever you're listening to this podcast so you can keep up to date with my new episodes and also expand your view of this beautiful world of painting and all that it has to offer. I'm Jeremiah Polachek. Thanks for listening. And as always, happy painting.